So first of all, I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of my background. I uh, have been in the pharmaceutical industry for 26 years. Um, and I have been associated with Penn in some teaching function or some laboratory function since 1978, um, 1988. 1978, I was in the clinical laboratory. I'm a microbiologist, a bacteriologist slash virologist by trade and by background. And um, I, uh, I got my PhD from Penn and um, I have been, uh, uh, I was in charge of, I've been in charge of the tuberculosis laboratory and back in 19... something Nashville, I might not feel that you're putting in as much work as all the other... Okay, I, 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 um, I thought somebody was trying to ask me something. Uh, I have been in charge of the tuberculosis laboratory from 1978 <laughs> to 1981. And um, also... Uh, I'm not going to stand this After that... Um, in 1988, I became part of the faculty and have kind of been on ever since and until I um, became an emeritus just recently. Um, so uh, this is how we're going to do it today. I gave my little introduction. I've done lots of other things besides science. But, um, one thing you can also uh, understand for me, um, one thing you can also understand for me is that uh, of course, I have in introduction I've done um, and I've done, like I said, I've done a lot of other things I can share with you later about um, uh, besides some science. Um, and I will give you one thing I like to do is keep track of the recent drug approval updates because I like to look at trends and where people are doing their research and where the jobs are for the young people that I talk to. People graduating from college and people in college who need internships. And I have been successful in placing some people. So that helps me. Um, that's what my trends information is really for. Um, and uh, so uh, we also look at initial public offerings. I'll explain to you what those are in the different therapeutic areas so that we can see the trends that people are interested in. And we'll have a discussion of, of different theories possibly the ecological impact, which is the most important thing to me. I'm an ecologist uh, by background too. Um, and then I'm going to, at the end, um, hopefully this will take about a half hour or so with the slides. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about the pen experience and how you can make the best of the four years, uh, three or four years, whichever, or even five that you plan to to uh, spread your education out over. And then we can have a Q&A. Um, I want to first explain to you what the uh, discovery process is like in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, uh, let's see if you can see my, can you see my little cursor there, my little pointer? I'm going to go to laboratory discovery. Um, that's the first step in looking for a new drug. And, um, and also after you get it, after you look at thousands and thousands of leads in laboratory discovery, then you go to preclinical research now, clinical research and preclinical research, the word clinical just means that it's in a human. So if it's preclinical, that means it has not had a human. It has not been yet in a human. So there's preclinical research. And then after you've done the lab and preclinical research, which usually is about a three, at least a three year period, um, then you can file for an investigational new drug or an IND. It goes down there, there, see? And then, then you're in the human being from now on. And phase one is where you give it to healthy human volunteers. And see, just and nobody's going to have any drastic, terrible reactions, um, either, in their, uh, either in their entire body or in their tissues. Um, and then if, that, if you pass that, that's usually a small group of people, like around 40 to 50 people. And... Um, if you pass phase one and then go to phase two, phase two is a group of people that have the specific disease that you're looking for. Um, so uh, if you're looking at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, you're looking specifically at people that have that disease. And then if you do well in phase two, which knocks most drugs out, phase two is the first really big failure point. And if you get past that, 
then you go to phase three, which means that your drug, which has promise, not only uh, goes into people that have the disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but people that have all kinds of other things. So now you're in the hodgepodge. Now when we are trying to cure that specific disease with the background of a lot of other types of sicknesses and people taking other types of drugs, which can really mess things up and can really uh, mean vicious challenges for your drug. Okay, so now uh, by the time you've gotten done all that, you're at about eight to 10 years at least, maybe sometimes 12 years. And once you announced your product that you're going to go forward with on your IND, um, your patent starts and your patent lasts for only 20 years on, on your drug. And so after that patent starts, uh, you've gone through all these phases. You might be 12 years into your process and you've eaten up 12 years of your 20 year patent. So that means you're only gonna have eight years to try and recoup the investigation or uh, uh, the expenses of that drug. So um, anyway, so that's, that's why it's a time labored process. And it, after so many decades and using up so many possible leads, the industry finally said, you know, I'm not only doing this, but the smaller companies like the small biotech and all, if you look to the bottom, they're going through the same process. So maybe I don't have to go through this process with every drug. I'll just come, I'll just look at some of these smaller companies and see if they have a promising drug that's in phase one or phase two, and I'll just buy it from them and start from there if it has promise. Well, um, so that meant that instead of everybody doing R&D over here in the large industry, that they would also, um, they would uh, allow people to have a job of looking around the world and see who was in phase one or phase two or even preclinical research for the kind of drug that they were looking for. And they would buy it from them or buy the company or what have you. Some people wouldn't want to sell their company, even though maybe the company, the pharmaceutical industry was offering them $500 million for it or, um, or even a billion dollars for it. Some people want to stick, stick it out in the company. And other people are looking to exit. They're looking to sell their drug and go on and do something else or else work for the larger company. So um, uh, anyway, so it became customary for the R&D effort to shift outside the company a bit and look at these other small companies. And the earlier you come, the earlier that you take the product from these companies, you see it gets redder. That means there's more risk involved. Some people had not so great research early on and they were trying to hide it. And or some people just, just didn't have the right idea. So you had to be very careful the earlier you look. Obviously, if you had somebody who wanted to give up their drug in phase three, that would be the best. But the earlier you looked at, and if it was a good promise, other companies would be looking too, so it would become very competitive. The earlier you looked, the more risk you had. See, increasing risk to adverse unmanageable levels here. Um, and so the industry became an outside, uh, they had quite a bit of outside interest. Also along those lines became new trends, uh, genetic techniques, et cetera. And also most recently, artificial intelligence. There are now more than a hundred artificial intelligence. I have at this time, I think there were 93 the time I made this slide. But the artificial intelligence looking for drugs now, uh, there are now from, from well more than a hundred companies uh, in the United States and in the world um, looking at artificial intelligence. And um, uh, it turned out artificial intelligence was not great in looking at the final product necessarily, but it could really help you in steps along the way. If you wanted to test an antibody, test it would take you normally three to four weeks. Um, this, this artificial intelligence could help you do hundreds of thousands of tests on an antibody within uh, a couple hours, seriously. And um, 
Then came along the replacement of animal testing. That's one of the more recent trends where instead of looking at animals, people wanted to look and see the way drugs will perform in humans. Why did that happen? Uh, not just the altruistic thing that people didn't want to, you know, uh, test in animals anymore, which I'm glad there's more of a feeling in that, that people uh, aren't thrilled about testing in animals and giving up animals for testing. Um, but it turned out also that animals had different ways that they metabolize drugs and different types of bone and different types of other tissues than humans did. So something that they could, uh, something that looked very good in an animal, sometimes a company could really get burned because when they got it in the human system, it didn't work quite as good. And it turned out uh, one study that happened like that was perfume, uh, uh, a perfume type substance in dogs. Um, and uh, it turned out that it was just wasn't good for humans. It had caused some reactions and stuff. So, uh, but there, there's all kinds of ways that people have gotten burned just for looking at animal data and trying to make predictions off of it. So um, a place called Emulate, which is a spinoff of the Wiss Institute in Boston, uh, kind of came along with something called tissue on the slide and organ in the chip and things like that, where they can make a little uh, uh, technological piece of equipment that would predict exactly how human systems would react. And the FDA is actually looking at that um, as a possible test mechanism. So there's their new areas and genetics has just exploded as you can imagine. I want to uh, just tell you the kind uh, two types of terminology that you're going to uh, hear off and on as you read articles. And I'll tell you which sites uh, at the end, I'll tell you which sites are the best to really to really uh, keep up with the pharmaceutical industry. But there are NCEs, new chemical entities, or what we call small molecules. You'll see in the literature, uh, people talking about small molecules. That's a new compound from chemical sources with a fixed molecular structure, and you can duplicate it. And um, uh, the only thing you have to do is, uh, before you can get money from it, is wait till the patent runs out. And then you have, the, the duplication is called a generic. So you know there are lots of generics now and that is really, uh, the generics as you'll see have really taken over this industry in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, at least in terms of some numbers of compounds. Then there are biologics or large molecules, antibodies and uh, proteins uh, that so other proteins so that they're very large, literally they're large molecules. And uh, the protein is usually from a living source and it cannot exactly be duplicated. And the reason why it, um, it cannot exactly be duplicated is because one of the reasons why, one of the key reasons is because there are so many steps in duplicating that protein and uh, the pharmaceutical industry put their heads together on this one and they said they started patenting certain steps, each step. So you can't make that molecule through the same process that they did. So you would have to go around it and hopefully get something that's close enough. So um, since you had to go for something that was similar enough and had similar activity, they called them, instead of generics, with large molecules, they call them biosimilars. And this is one area that you're going to hear of in the 20s that's going to be huge. It already has been huge, um, but they tend to be very expensive molecules because of the amount of work that goes into them. And they're very hard to get onto the market because um, the company that has the original molecule or protein um, has patented maybe nine or 10 steps along the way. And uh, every time somebody tries to come out with a biosimilar, they, the company, original company takes them to court and say, hey, you know, this process over here may be off patent, but this process here is not off patent. And so they're able to hold them up for another couple of years. And so uh, usually they're monoclonal antibodies or antibody drug conjugates. They're, they're, they've been taken from a living source. Okay, now going back to the small molecules again, um, I've taken a rolling 10-year uh, average 
if you take a if you take one year at a time, you get bars that go up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, they yield a trend, but you have to look at them over large periods. And so what I've done is I've taken 10 year rolling average and where you take a 10 year group and you kick out the end or you kick out the beginning and add on to the end. And so so it's rolling. Um, and it gives you a nice smooth curve. As you can see, it gives you almost like a growth curve. And you see there was a dip. Uh, what happened there in the early 2000s with the dip was that we began to use up targets. And there just wasn't, you know, everybody was trying to look for something, some target, and they just weren't available anymore because we've already had all the drugs out. Look at all the drugs. We've already had all the drugs out um, that could, uh, be applied to those targets. So then uh, with new technology and other things, artificial intelligence now and all kinds of things, we started to get new targets and up goes the chart again. And that'll happen for a while. And uh, so I keep looking at that to see when that starts down again. You can only take so many targets before you use them up again. And, and, you know, and then you've got to use new technology and, and things like that. Um, now, just to show you what things would look like if you use one year at a time, see how they go up and down and up and down. If you look at new products, the other thing that helps the industry out a lot is that if you look at the bright blue bars at the bottom, they're brand new molecules, both small molecules and large molecules. They're brand new molecules for that year. As you can see, we have 41 approvals so far in this year through August. Um, but the other, the larger, uh, the, the larger bars are um, are other things that you can do with that drug. For example, there are new formulations or um, new ways of injecting them or new delivery methods, other new delivery methods, et cetera. And every one of those is a new payday for the industry. And so we count those too. It's not just when a drug was initially brought out on the market, but also these other Things. For example, Merck brought a drug out for uh, cancer, for, uh, for uh, melanoma in 2014, and every year it gets two or three new cancers that the testing is completed for, and so it adds up. It has about 14 different cancers that, it, that it's effective for. So, uh, so all these things are other ways that the pharmaceutical industry can try and reimburse the expenses met. Yeah, and, and you have to you have to understand too. They have you know for ten years of researching a drug, and all the equipment, and the people's salaries, uh, and the people's health care that work for them. There's a lot of expenses that they have accumulated in those ten years. Um, now, uh, looking at the small molecules again, each one of these colors is a different therapeutic area that you can see on the right here. Oncology, neurology. Oh, the meeting won't connect. And um, the oncology is uh, the cancer. Oncology is the largest one that we've been successful for so far. Um, the United States <clears throat> has made a commitment since the Kennedy administration back in the 1960s that they would spend more money on cancer and they would uh, agree to attack cancer. So you see, looking at the graph down here, oncology is the green. And if you look, um, it has been the occupier of, uh, of cancer, of uh, research. And in fact, you can see it's almost ready to break a record this year. Uh, 11 and 12 were the earlier tops. It's already got nine and this year, it's, this week it's gonna have 10. And so uh, we're only uh, two thirds of the way through the year. So we're gonna set a record pace in cancer this year. This other blue, this bright blue behind it was neurology. Everybody got into looking for Alzheimer's disease and, um, and Parkinson's disease, but so many big companies have been burned because they had a promising lead and spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on it only to see those leads fail. So they've given up a little bit on neurology and have farmed that out to some of the smaller companies. Um, and one thing I want to show you um, is looking at oncology. Uh, if you look at all, these are the mechanisms of actions of all the drugs that have been discovered this year. And everything is one, 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 one. 
But if you look at oncology, there's one type of mechanism, seven you see in there. And it turns out that that green mechanism, that's the signaling mechanism. Seven new cancer compounds this year have come out, which affect the signaling mechanism. And I'm going to show you later on how that works. I'm going to just show you this show you right now. Two slices of uh, I'm just going to show you uh, right now what what that uh, how that mechanism uh, works, and then I'm going to go into detail later because it's an important mechanism. Uh, you see right here, these are called G protein coupled receptors. These things that look like seven tubes in a row, and they have those along the membrane. And uh, when a compound hits those, they send off a reaction, and it goes into the uh, this type of receptor over here, oftentimes, and uh, it signals uh, certain things for the cell to do. And those signals are very, very important in whether a cell can turn cancerous or not. Once they found out those signaling molecules, those G protein couple receptors, um, um, you can see there's six or seven companies a year that find new ways to attack cancer through those molecules. Uh, this is also, this receptor is important for another thing, which I'm going to talk to you about a little later when we get into ecology, because this receptor helps people, helps humans and animals, actually. It's all throughout the animal kingdom. Um, and there are some surrogates and bacteria and plants, but this type of receptor is very, very important all throughout the animal kingdom. And it helps animals to care. It's one of the receptors. One of the jobs of that receptor is to help animals and people to care about other things. And so we are not only, one reason why I feel strongly about things the way I do in this world, is we're not only able to care as a species, uh, and as animals, as a species, but we are actually hardwired to do so. So don't let anybody tell you that caring is not a big deal because caring about other members of the species, we're hardwired to do it and other species too. And I'm going to show you that at the end. That's worth sticking around for, it, right? It's pheromones and all those kinds of things all work off of this receptor. So we'll come back to that very shortly. Um, now the monoclonal antibodies, the large molecules, even with those, and you can see those are those have caught on recently. Uh, but even those, you can see cancer oncology again, um, it monopolizes that. The gray in here, uh, which is also important, is the anti inflammatory things like arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and that kind of thing. So those are important with molecules, monoclonal antibodies also. Um, and this is just a list of the drugs that have been approved this year, the brand new drugs. And uh, what you can see that's very interesting, if you, um, I'm just going to tell you about this because it takes a lot of looking, but they're very smaller, they're smaller companies also, often Trevina, um, Dr. Reddy's Labs, Aztec's Farm, Cosmo Technology, Ultragenics. So, um, the smaller groups with that new technology have been able to, to nab things. And you can see it over here with the market cap. Those that are not in red are small companies. Okay. And these are the diseases. And there's a lot of uh, offshoot diseases, not big ones, but some things like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, Here's one acute pain. It's the recent opioid that's been um, that's been on, added onto the market, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. So I'm writing a paper on that. Um, and then I have also here the large molecules, the bio, three biosimilars this year, which are having trouble taking off in America because the big companies are fighting them with their patents. But in Europe, you see, it's a different story. Um, there's a different patent system and um, different rules for their drugs there. And, um, and then there's some other uh, large molecules uh, down here. This is one I wanted to talk to you about going into business. And you suddenly take a couple of your colleagues when you're ready to get out of pen and say, hey, look, we can do these things. We can, we can uh, 
do some proteomics. We're pretty good at uh, gene stuff and all that kind of stuff. Why don't we start a company and, um, you know, we can get some targets to go after. And a lot of people take that. And, and not only uh, people in college, but people who are in their 60s and 70s that retire and say, hey, let's start our own company. Let's do it. And so um, what you have to do is you have to get funding because it's expensive. Lab equipment is expensive. Renting laboratory space is expensive. So the first thing you do, um, there are three sources that you can go to. Crowdfunding, um, when you're familiar with crowdfunding, where somebody gets, a, gets something on the computer and says, please donate to this, I'm gonna start this. And so, um, so crowdfunding is one thing. Angels are another thing, and angels are little companies that give up to three to five hundred thousand dollars. So, but that can be, as you know, as you'll find out, three to five hundred thousand dollars can be eaten up very quickly. But angels are very good to help you get started. And then the last resort that you have is the triple F over here, FFF, which means uh, these are the these are the ones you can turn to: family, friends, and fools. Okay, <laughs> that's a little acronym that we use when people start in families, friends, friends, and fools that invest their money in, in somebody's idea. And uh, so those, those are the three sources you can use. But then when you get some excitement, when you get a lead and you're in the early stage, then venture capitalists start looking at you. And they're talking about Series A here, which can be 30 to $40 million dollars. Now we're talking because you've probably hired about 10 people. Very expensive. Nothing eats up money like people. You've hired, hired, probably hired about 10 people. You've got big uh, sequencers and all these other things that are, that are eating up money. And you've got all kinds of things that you have to do, raw materials that you have to get. In the resources. So, um, so uh, uh, 40 to $50 million will hold you for a little while. But if your idea looks like it's going to take off, remember, somebody's watching you. The pharmaceutical companies in the area say, hey, you know, how much you want for that compound? I'll take it off your hands and uh, bring it over to my area. And so not everybody goes through B, C, and D. Some of them just go through Series A, and then the company either merges with them, buys them out, buys the compound, uh, whatever you know, you've decided to do, and that's a very wealthy payday. Um, some people get out at that point, and some people stay in and say, "Well, let's see what else I can get." Um, but that's how it goes. And when you finally, if you finally said, "Wait a minute, I'm going to hold on to my idea. I'm going to start a company, and I'm going for the big area here. I'm going for the big bucks, and I'm going for. I want to build a company of a hundred people." or a couple hundred people, or maybe a thousand people. And so you offer stock in your company, IPO, an initial public offering. That's the very first public offering of your stock. And so that's what, that's what, uh, that's when you're in the big time. Now you've got the public trying to fund you. And if you don't have an idea, if your idea is not going to work, the analysts and the public find out real fast and start dumping your stock. But whenever you have an initial public offering, I make offering, I make notice of that. And I've been doing that since 2016. And this is just 2020, okay? And um, you can see, first of all, I do a couple of things. I do location and I do right down to this, right down to the city. And, um, but California and Massachusetts are, are the two biggest areas where new biotechnology companies form. You can see this year, 17 and 14, 17 in California, 14 in Massachusetts, and it's neck and neck between those two states every year. And so um, those are, so if I know that there's a new company forming that way, I tell students about it. So upon graduation, so they can jump in and uh, get a head start, you know, uh, ahead of other people that might be um, looking around the country. And you can see Pennsylvania just has two right now. The reason why California and Massachusetts um, are so often in front of everybody is they have built a, a society almost. They, they have uh, resources and they have, 
you know, all kinds of investments going in there. So they've built campuses of companies um, uh, in, in California, Massachusetts. They might have uh, 300 companies on a campus and that kind of thing. And, and so they've, they've culturalized it. They've got, they've got a biotech culture in San Francisco, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and other places throughout the state. So that's why they're off ahead of everybody. And I, oh, by the way, these green cancer, see that? See how many, 10 companies were formed so, so far this year on cancer. Um, and if I look at just this year and, and the timing, you know, here you got the months of the year, but then I keep the previous years. Like I said, I've been doing this since 2016. I keep the previous years and you can see cancer as the years go by and cancer is going to set a record this year in new companies. So it's not just new compounds, it's new companies. Okay. And if you took that green at the bottom and made a graph just of the cancer, just the green, you can see how it's going up. And this year, by the way, this week, I haven't had a chance to get it on yet this morning. There's going to be 19 this morning. And so we're going to, we're going to break the record. Um, and if you put it in a pie chart, I always liked pie charts when I was in uh, uh, college and, and, and high school because I was getting hungry. You know, pie charts made me think of food. But anyway, um, um, but I always liked pie charts. They always helped me to visualize things nicely. And uh, if you look at here, you can easily see the cancer is dominating where the new companies are going in 2020. And it has been that way recently. So some trends from this part of the database. Uh, and I'm finished with that part of the database right now. And I'm going to say, number one, there's a surge in IPOs. You know, I know that for the individual worker, life has not been easy at this particular time of the year. But there are a lot of new companies being formed. And um, biotech companies are replacing aspects of big pharma R&D. The new chemical entities are high, but from smaller companies. And a wealth of funding from 2018 on into biotech from venture capital. Oncology research, cancer research is very high. Now there's more than 100 artificial intelligence companies in biotech. And then there's Oregon on a chip trying to replace animals and testing, which is a good thing, okay? And now I'm gonna go back to this receptor I promised you about a little bit. Um, tell you just a little bit about this because this is the most important receptor I think that we have in our bodies. And like I say, this is involved in signaling and I'm going to talk to you about ecology a little bit and taking things from the environment, taking signals from the environment. Not only do we do that as humans, we do that as humans and other members of the ecosystem do that as animals and, um, and plants even too, because, um, well, plants don't use this specific receptor, but all animals do and humans do. Um, of course, we are an animal, but uh, looking at the G protein couple receptors, um, let me give you an example of how this does something from in the environment. Say you've got an olfactory cell. You remember the olfactory tissue in your nose that's involved with smell? Dogs are the best in that one. Um, but let me uh, show you how this cell works in a human. So this is one cell looking at one olfactory cell. And um, you may have 25,000 G protein couple receptors on the membrane of this one cell. Say, let's say for that, uh, we've got uh, uh, 25,000. And in some cases, that's even a low number. Um, now, on Saturday evening, you and your buddy say, well, let's go out and let's have, you know, let's have a good time and uh, we'll, we'll see who we can meet and all that kind of stuff. And so the guy gets in the car, guy goes to pick up his buddy, the guy gets in the car and he's got tons of aftershave on, okay? And the guy driving says, whoa, man, how much aftershave did you put on? Um, but it hits him that way because um, the guy has 25,000 G protein couple receptors and is on factory cell, olfactory cell, uh, taking in that in. So, but after a while, 
after just a few minutes, the guy driving the car doesn't even notice it anymore. He doesn't smell it anymore. Because what happens is the G protein couple receptors sent this signal to the nucleus, which sent it to the brain and back. And instead of 25,000 receptors on the cell, it downloads them off of the cell. And now you've only got about 5,000 up there. And so all the rest have been pulled into the cell. Some of them have been broken down and some of them have been weighted to recycle. But uh, uh, 20,000 receptors have been pulled in off of, the, off of the cell. And that's what happens. That's you know the same when somebody gets into a car with a lot of perfume. When I was working my way through college, I worked in an oil refinery. And the petroleum smell, the carbon, the biocarbon smell in the oil refinery, you know, it's very wicked when you first get in there. But 10 minutes, you didn't even notice it anymore. You could work there all day, all week, you know, because you didn't notice it coming in and out of there because your this cell was kind enough to downgrade the number of receptors. Your brain says, you know, you don't need that many receptors. Uh, that, that's a pretty strong molecule. So they downloaded the number of receptors and now you're used to it. You know, and that you just try that sometime with that. And smell is only one of the things it works with. It also works with um, pheromones, your sexual drive. It also works with various chemicals and you know, biochemicals that, um, you know, that your body needs. But it, look, it seeks out the environment and sees what's in the environment. Um, and your environment could be just this room. OK, um, but a lot of things happen on the basis of those receptors. One of the most prominent. One of the most not prominent, but I'd say one of the most important G protein couple receptors that people that become a household word almost because they've uh, destroyed some families. They've destroyed some people and destroyed some communities here in Philadelphia, and that is the mu opioid receptor is a G protein couple receptor and there are various kinds of that and you know people have been trying to look at things that would compete with this re compete with the opioids for this type of receptor and they have found some and that's why some people you know you'll give that drug when you see somebody has passed out on the street you come up and give them that drug and it saves their life uh, from an overdose and because you're you're given their cheap protein double receptors uh, they're given competition to the opioid drug and um, so that's a very important one but there's a bunch like that and um, you know this is the receptor that looks at the environment and makes you care especially prominent in dogs and cats and other animals but you know humans uh, we have it too and so we are just, we are capable of caring and reacting to our environment okay we are capable of doing it. not only are we capable of doing it we are hardwired for it we we've got the goods to do that okay and that's why i know we can care as a species because we got the goods okay and uh so i wanted to um uh, another thing about the environment um uh this is called a web of causation which you know if you think about things if you ever have a some extra credits to take and you want to take an ecology course because that's the thing that is pressing this planet right now and everything works off ecology it can be the ecology of a of a school it can be ecology of a of a group that works together in a lab it can be um ecology of a little pond um or it can be the ecology of your gut your your intestine and that's what happens with uh um with certain diseases where you know you'll you'll take one drug for something else and you'll get a diarrhea because the the flora the microflora of your intestine has been changed and you can't change one thing in an ecosystem without uh changing other things you cannot one thing the way you know you've got an ecosystem is because you can't change something in the ecosystem without changing something else and so what you do whenever you've got an issue or a problem or a paper to write 
you look at the problem like this right here. This is called a web of causation. It was developed in the late 1960s and early 1970s by McMahon and Pugh of Harvard. And um, what they what they do um, is they take an issue and then they look at uh, what affects that issue. Now there are some webs like this, and you can see them. All you gotta do is go on uh, in Google and put web of causation and they'll show you different forms. But um, there are some like this that the closer you get to the issue, the more important the box is. That was not McMahon and Pugh's web of causation. Their web of causation was to take everything in the environment, make sure you've got everything in the environment, put it on the screen and give them equal weight. And then you can decide as you sift through it, which things were important because the important thing could sometimes be out here and you weren't looking for it. Okay. So that's the McMahon and Pew web of causation. And if you change one of these boxes, you change other things. And so that's, that's what, um, that's what this is. And you go to write a paper. Um, and, and if a, a professor sees something like this, he will say, well, I know one thing, he certainly has thought out the problem. He certainly has thought about the problem. And you can even take one box and talk about it versus another, uh, you know, and take, then take another box and talk about it. Or um, your professor could say to you, this is really fascinating. And I see you've looked at this, but how about this over here? Have you tried there? Because he's been in the field longer and he can help you. So uh, the web of causation is very important to get to know. I think it's helped me. It's how I looked at my opioid situation what i'm doing with these two other professors um that, uh, that are working on this and um, also uh, i'm looking at another thing with uh, uh g protein couple receptors of course um looking at an environment but uh important thing to remember about environments is you can't change one thing without changing other things in the environment you can't do that and so if you think um if you think you're going to uh, litter without um, changing other things in the planet, not going to happen. Let me tell you something about new viruses. We're almost done here, so we've got a good, good amount of time. Uh, let me tell you something about new organisms in the environment, because that's how, I, at GlaxoSmithKline, that's how we used to look for new antibiotics, was take, the, take soil out of the environment. Um, there are bacteria and viruses in the environment all the time that are just there. They're okay, you know, and, but they're one mutation, one mutation away from becoming something really bad. So you take and you throw plastic bottles in the environment and that kind of thing. Not only are they going to plug things up and, and cause floods and stuff, but aside from that, stuff leaches out of those bottles, out of the plastic and out of the other materials that are in paper and all that stuff leaches out of there. It turns out to be a mutagen for some bacterium that would normally not be, you, you wouldn't worry about at all. And, you know, so you get new viruses and new bacteria spun off all the time. Um, you get some protective ones spun off too, but you get new ones spun off all the time. People say, where in the heck did that thing come from? Well, you know, you got to learn to take care of your planet and keep your environment clean, okay? I always tell people, you know, you wouldn't uh, have people come into your house and when they finish the candy bar, they would throw the wrapper down on the floor. You wouldn't want that. It's the same thing in the, in the environment. You can't throw things out the car window and expect nothing to happen. You know, this is your home. This is your planet. And this planet has really been abused these past few decades, really, really been abused. And uh, it doesn't have much more left to, to be abused. I mean, the Audubon people here told me that in 10 years, uh, we will have one third of the bird species of birds in Pennsylvania that we do today. So we are abusing the daylights out of this planet and we're not going anywhere soon as far as finding a new planet to live on. Okay, so we gotta, you gotta, think about the environment and get people, get other people to think about the environment in this planet. And that's especially true because if you look at the way our population grows, um, 
uh, here's a neat chart that I got from the Census Bureau from 1 AD. Uh, you can see how long it took to get a billion people, okay? And then 2 billion, and then 3 billion. And look at the change in years, how quickly it happens. By 2023, we should be up at 8 billion. And I took this off of the census thing myself on Friday. This is Friday afternoon. We had 7,600,000 people uh, in, the, uh, in the world. And we had 330 million people in the United States. And um, uh, every time every time somebody says hi to me, you know, I mess up my count. I have to start all over. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, I got this. Um, the Census Bureau has a, has a chart that turns over all the time. And you can get it at any given second uh, and see what the, what the uh, population is. So um, uh, just don't forget. You know, you've got a lot of people to convince and you've got a lot of people to get fed and um, it all works off of the environment. Um, and you're going to learn about things at Penn that will help you do that. And in fact, environmental engineers are becoming a new area of workers that are getting pretty good salaries, I want to tell you. Look into environmental engineering sometime. So your future is really quite bright especially when we get over the virus thing. Um, maybe next semester, you'll be all back here. You've got a world full of opportunities. You'll have personalized medicine where you can take a person's eco, uh, immune system and adapt it. Uh, you can work with their genes. You can work with proteins. And always remember one thing, the plan with the ecosystem in mind. Um, because it doesn't help you come out with new things and perturb what's already there and send it into haywire. You know, and I can give you lots of examples. If you haven't had enough, I can give you more examples why that happens, especially with microbiology and, and, and with medicine, I can, I can tell you. Um, and with that, I like to say, uh, uh, welcome to Penn. Um, you've got a lot of opportunity for careers in science. And, um, I want to say, and come on now. Um, and and uh, show me your face because uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you some pointers on on getting through here. We've got some time, and uh, I can tell you by some of the mistakes that I made when I was an undergraduate in college. Um, and uh, one thing you've got to do is make your time at Penn count. Okay, uh, thank you, Javier, for coming on. Um, uh, make your time at Penn count. And, um, and start in right away. The best thing you can do in college is start in right away. And my freshman year, I remember, you know, you have a tendency to put some things off, uh, but you've got to start in studying right away. Remember in high school where you said, um, teacher said to you, uh, this paper will be due on October 20th. And so now you didn't know a lot at that particular time, but you knew one thing. October 19th was going to be bad. Okay. <laughs> the night of October 19th was going to be awfully bad. You know, don't let that happen in college. Okay. When somebody gives you a paper, you start in right away. Make sure it's something that if you can choose the topic that you like, and they usually will be a chance to choose the topic, make sure it's something that you like so that you can start looking at it right away and um, make your causal web do whatever and you'd be surprised what'll come out of that and, and you won't have everything to do at the last minute and um uh, the other thing that you can do um along those lines um uh, now that you don't have i know you don't have the chance to rub elbows with each other because some of you are talking from home in different parts of the country and different parts of the world actually um but what you can do you see this technology that we're using now, and I've done this before. In fact, I did that with that with the, that cell with the receptors on it. You know, you can get interest groups together. You can get study groups together. You can get all kinds of things that you can do in four or five groups of people online. Um, you can talk about music, or you can listen to music together, and you can meet people. Um, or you can, um, you know, what I did 
when I was at Merck, actually, this course, uh, this was kind of neat. And it was just a thing. It seemed like a natural thing to do. Thank you all for coming on. Uh, you are a great looking group. And um, I just, uh, I took the recept all the different receptors. And, you know, there are lots of different receptors on the, on the cell. I took a person who was an expert in each one of those receptors. And I invited them to web webinars. And we had a monthly webinar group because I wanted them to learn since all the receptors talk to each other. I mean, just think of the cell with each one of you being a receptor. All the receptors talk to each other. It's an environment. I called it cellular ecology because the receptors made up an environment, made up an ecosystem. And I said, uh, do you guys know how your receptors talk to each other? No, because they, they spent so much time looking at the receptor. You have to, very competitive. But they were fascinated by the idea. This guy over here was working on a different receptor. How do our receptors talk to each other? And that group meant monthly. And uh, we had people offering us money uh, by the end of the thing, uh, societies and stuff. But you can do things like that. You can either take an interest group where you need to relax or you can take uh, a group where, hey, um, let's have a study group. And you get together five people online like this. And you say, what did that guy mean when he said uh, the Sarosi principle? What did he mean by that? I know he tried to explain it. I didn't get it. Did you get it? And you could have a study. Wharton has little rooms like that where you can get together. And, and I'm sure other places do too, where you can study. Well, you're not going to get a chance to do that for this semester maybe but you can do it on the computer anything that you can do in person just about you can do on the computer so um you can get study groups that you formed and you can meet people you can meet each other you know and um, um and uh, then when you come back to penn be it the second semester or what have you probably um won't be hopefully won't be too much um, because, you know, people are working on things as we speak. Um, when you come back to Penn, you can say, hey, I'm going to look up Katie, uh, <laughs> that, that, that young lady that I used to have coffee with online. I'm going to look her up. And I can't wait to meet Nathan because, you know, he, you know, he, he was a good guy online and he kept our group moving. So I'm going to look him up when I get. So you've already got things you can do for the second semester. When you come back on campus, you're going to have friends. And so, you know, uh, take down names and say, hey, I'm going to get your email. Um, and, um, and, you know, you could uh, you could say, I'm going to get your email. And would you like to be part of a study group? Or would you like to be part of an interest group in uh, rock music or country music or whatever it happens to be? Or would you like to be part of an interest group in philosophy or in anything? Um, and, uh, and I'm having trouble with calculus. Um, I don't know if there was ever a person born who didn't have trouble with calculus. I think even Isaac Newton must have had trouble with No, I'm just kidding. But um, I, I, I can't think of anybody who who, who uh, it was just so, I mean, it just took me down in my freshman year. Yeah, I just had the worst time with calculus. And so I would have given anything for a group like this to say, you know, I have no idea. And I was good in math, but calculus was just hard for me. And, um, and remember what I said, for your schoolwork, start in right away and come home for your, you know, you don't have to come home for your class right now, but when your class is done, read through your notes and print them. I found, even if I had the TV on when I was in my dorm or my off-campus house, even if I had the TV on, if I just read through my psych notes or whatever, they would imprint and I could remember what I was doing or what I was seeing when, you know, when I saw that phrase later in a test, I could remember what I was doing. And so they imprint on your brain. So just take five minutes before you go down to dinner and read through some of your notes or something like that, or before you eat a meal and you will be amazed at the difference that makes and you you may sometimes um be able to be able to get ahead you know be get, you'll be ahead by by a few days and that's helpful because you know sometimes you fall behind unnecessarily sometimes you're going along in the semester and you're a couple of days ahead and all of a sudden you get the flu and you don't you don't feel like looking at that stuff you know and your cumulative average is very important so you don't want it to go down so um you know at least when you lose a couple of days you'll be 
you know, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to not be so bad off like you were if you were behind to begin with and then got sick. And so you're going to have all kinds of things like that. I mean, some of you, like I said, when you come back on campus next year or, or maybe even in your study groups, you know, one thing that I found that some of you are going to fall in love, you know, and nothing does a number on a cumulative average like falling in love. Let me tell you that, that just destroys because you, know, you get weeks behind when you're pining away. At your, but, but anyway, but uh, but there could be all kinds of things that you're going to that you're going to get involved with during the course of the semester that will interfere uh, and maybe take you back by a couple of days. Maybe you got to go to somebody's wedding in Arkansas or something way far away and you lose two, three days. So it doesn't hurt to be a couple of days ahead, you know, and, and uh, think about the study groups. Think about a plan, your advisor and on. Think about having a four year plan that you can stick to and and see when you have some open credits and, and things of that nature and make good relationships with your professors because uh, you do that by working hard in his class. If you're having a class that you're doing very, very well in, first of all, it, it can tell you something that you're doing very, very well in that class. Obviously you're good at it, okay? And so if, you, um, if that professor comes to, you know, comes to respect your work, um, then, when the time comes that he's looking for a lab assistant and you need some extra money or you're looking for an internship, you know, um, then he, he wants somebody whose work he can trust. Um, and uh, so uh, that's kind of a thing that, you know, and he will probably write you a letter of recommendation. I've written a lot of recommendations in, in my time. In fact, I've gotten people, I've gotten people from one of these lectures I got in the person a job in a new company one time, and um, and it was an animal health company, and it was just what they wanted because they did their um, they did their uh, work assignments to get money for school. They did their work assignments um, in uh, in the veterinarian school. So do that, and and any relationship that you make can be very positive later, um, and and I want you to remember that. This is very important. Sometimes, you know, I know Penn's a difficult place sometimes, you know, because it's, it doesn't want to hurt you. It wants to challenge you. Okay. So make sure if you get upset, there's nothing in life, you know, uh, almost nothing that can't be fixed. Okay. You remember that. So before you get too despondent, if you're having some issues, Penn's got all kinds of support systems, you know, make sure, you know, you make use of those support systems. They're there for you. And uh, as over the coming week, you'll probably learn about some of those support systems where you can just talk to somebody. And I mean, if you need somebody to talk to, we're all here for you. But before um, you give up on yourself, you know, there are very few things that can't be fixed. And um, we all make mistakes and we all do things and we all get in the hole, make sure uh, um, that you take advantage of the resources that are available to you um, and, uh, um, and make sure that you talk to people. And that's why it's good to have little, little groups that you can do on the computer because you can talk over things. And uh, am I nuts or did this guy just give us a hundred page thing, you know, uh, or, you know and, and, or, you know, you can come, you know, this is happening at home and I'm all upset because you know when somebody can talk you through that so um and lastly very lastly now and i'm going to turn you loose if, if unless you have some questions very lastly don't forget to now i usually say at this point call home okay but you don't have to do that because probably most of you are at home or maybe in an apartment but um, make sure you say to your folks whoever it is parents guardians uh, friends who have helped you along to this part Make sure you say to them um, uh, how much you, appre you have appreciated that. I mean, one thing I wish in my life was that I had told, I had used words to say more to my parents. Uh, I can't do that anymore. And I wished I had done it when they were still around because um, uh, you, you get only one chance to express yourself, you know, and make sure you get to do that. Um, if you, you know, 
you people right now are successful. You're at a successful pinnacle in life. There will be a lot of people that would trade places with you right now. And so make sure you say, um, hey, mom, have I ever told you how much I appreciate and how wonderful I feel about everything that you've done to get me to this point? Have I ever told you that, mom? And she'll say, Oh, that's so sweet. That is really so sweet. And it's a really good try, but I've already allotted all the expenses that I can for your spending money. There's no money. But, uh, no, but anyway, uh, verbalize things to the people around you that care uh, and that have gotten you to this point. Um, before you're someplace 40 years later and you say, boy, I wish I would have said, you know, so thank you for attending my talk. And at this point, I will take any questions. I will stay here for as long as somebody. I know you have to go other places now um, online and stuff. Don't forget about the little groups to form. OK, don't forget about that.